And the question is, how are we to conduct ourselves as believers in the face of this uh, difficult uh, situation? What difference in response to COVID infection there is between a believer and an unbeliever? And this is crucial for us. So here in our passage, Peter you know, uh, deals with God living in the sphere of suffering. He focuses specifically on suffering for doing good. But the principles of Christians' response to suffering is basically the same. Let's take a brief review in our study of Peter's first epistle. And we have seen that Peter wrote to suffering Christians scattered throughout Asia Minor because of persecution. And Peter begins the epistle expounding the great salvation in Christ. And that begins in chapter 1, verse 3, until chapter 2, verse 10. And then we read in verse 11 and 12 of chapter 2, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the introduction or the umbrella to all the succeeding exhortations. We have in those two verses, we have as pilgrims and sojourners in this uh, present world first, we are to engage in a spiritual warfare against sin. And then secondly, we must live a godly life before the watching world. We read that in verse 12. So here we see the point. Peter is driving clearly that salvation's purpose is for Christians to be a living witness for Christ and his gospel in this world. We are not saved to enjoy salvation only but to constantly be conscious why we were saved. And the issue here that I would like to ask you, are you conscious that you are uh, to live for this purpose, to be a living witness before the world? We have seen five spheres where believers are to manifest a good testimony before the world. And the first is in chapter 2, verses 13 to 17, where we see there the sphere of civil authorities. Then in chapter 2, verses 18 to 25, the sphere of work. And then in chapter 3, 1 to 7, the sphere of marriage. And the common denominator for these three spheres uh, is submission to those who are in authority. And then we also look at another sphere, which is the sphere of the church. That is in chapter 3, 8 to 12. So there we see that believers are to keep the unity of mind, having compassion for one another, loving and respectful for one another, and blessing those who hurt us. And this is our testimony before the Lord. The church must show its difference before what is happening outside it, the world. So that's what we see here. And then we are going to study for uh, this afternoon uh, the spear of suffering. This is what we see in verses 13 to 17, the passage which was read to us. And again, let me read this to you. Beginning in verse 13, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ, the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. Now we see here the issue that the, of godly living in the face of suffering. Now we know that Paul said in Acts 14, 22, 
Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount, there is a narrow road that leads to life. Now, you are not expecting a suffering-free journey to heaven, are you? Or aren't you? So in the context here, we see, uh, we see the context of Christian suffering. We are to look at the example of our master, the Lord Jesus Christ, whenever we go through this uh, kind of suffering. And when we look at the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is incomparable to what we go through in suffering. We read that in verse 18. Verse uh, chapter 4, verse 1 and 13. And Peter would want us always, whenever we go through suffering in this life, or because of our faith, we simply need to look at our master, the Lord Jesus Christ. He went through the same, and we must follow his steps. So Peter knew this well. He was with the Lord in all those three years when Christ walked as the incarnate Son of God in this world. Peter saw the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ culminating at the cross. And so with that perspective, he sees Christians as following the Master. We are no different with our Masters because we are his disciples. Now look at verse 17. It tells us, for it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. Now there, Peter shows us two kinds of suffering caused by persecution. Suffering for doing good and suffering for doing evil. Now if you will note, Peter says, uh, using comparison, it is better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. No, Peter is not saying here that when you do evil, it is good, only it is not as good as doing good. Now, we know that suffering for doing good is God's will. That is what Peter said here. But suffering for doing evil is not God's will. Yet believers, the fact is that believers, Peter is saying here, can suffer for doing evil because of the remaining sin in us. And he hopes, Peter hopes, that no Christian suffers for doing evil. And I hope there is none of us who are suffering because of uh, doing uh, evil. So don't expect God to bless you if you suffer for doing evil. You cannot expect this blessing when you are suffering uh, because of your uh, sins. And what you need to do is to repent of that sin and receive the forgiveness of God. And that will give you peace and you will be blessed if you do that. So if you are suffering because of what you, what you did uh, as an uh, evil thing that you did, first thing you do, repent. Go to God and ask God to forgive you and give you peace of mind. Now, there are, we, uh, we are going to focus here, as Peter focused, on the suffering of believers for doing good. Right? That is what we find in this passage. Suffering for doing good. There are only two points that we are going to look at. We'll spend more time in the second point. There is the first point, a general way to avoid suffering costs by persecution. Then we have... An exemption to the general way to avoid suffering costs by persecution. So let's take up the first. A general way to avoid suffering costs by persecution. And what is the general way here to avoid persecution, to avoid suffering caused by persecution? Peter said, be zealous for what is good. Be zealous for what is good. And you know the argument of the Apostle Peter here. He says he, 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 he is doing a, um, a, like a catechism. He is giving a question, and then we know the answer. The answer is assumed. He says, who is there to harm you if 
you are zealous for what is good. Who is there to harm you? And obviously, the answer would be no one. If you are zealous for what is good, no one will hurt you. So here we see Peter assures his readers that if they go do good, they can expect to avoid suffering. Now, Matthew 7, 12, you know here the, uh, the positive uh, golden rule. This is not the, the, uh, the principle uh, the, uh, made by Confucius, which is negative. It is not, uh, do not do unto others what you do not want others to do unto you. It's a negative uh, 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 principle. Just don't do anything and people will not do anything to you. But Matthew, but Matthew 7, 12 says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So he's saying here the positive uh, aspect of this golden rule. Whatever you want men do to you, do also to them. This is active actively doing something for the for others and so that you can expect what uh, what are the positive things uh, that others would do unto you that is what we find here right this is the principle if you are zealous for what is good who is there to harm you okay therefore whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Now, what you will note here, if this is not simply doing good as a duty. This is not that simply doing good works as a duty. The word used here is zealous or zelotes or zelos in Greek, which uh, our English word zealous was uh, taken from. A person who is determined to do something, no matter what it costs, that is a zealot. It is that inner attitude rather than an outward act. So a zealot is someone passionate in his own heart about something, and he would, he would not rest not doing it. And Peter is saying here, be zealous for what is good. Have that inner attitude and passion to do good to others. Don't do it out of duty. Do it because it's who you are as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. It should be uh, uh, part of your renewed, renewed uh, nature, your renewed uh, person. Uh, you are to be zealous. You have to be passionate for what is good. And Peter is saying here, even to those who are antagonistic to Christian, he's saying here the principle, do good to those who persecute you even. And so in Matthew 5, 16, again, in the Sermon on the Mount, so there are, a lot of things taken from the Sermon on the Mount of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Matthew 5, 16, it tells us, Let your light shine up before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So that is the, the, uh, the, uh, the function of believers in this fallen world, to let uh, uh, the shine, to let shine, shine before men. So that what is that? They may see our good deeds and that people may praise and glorify our Father in heaven. So here we see that Peter does not give a full list of all the what constitutes good deeds or what is good. But we can gather from the entire letter that in, it includes compassion to those who are suffering or who are in need. It includes those loving others. We have seen that. The chapter 1, 22, chapter 2, 17, here, and then in chapter 3, 8, and now here in chapter 4 as well, verse 8. 
Then in chapter 4, verse 9, it's about hospitality. And then we see as well bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Those are good deeds. Those are what is good that we need to produce and that we need to show to people. See, those are the good deeds that we need to, um, um, to show the world. So the point here is that it has to be the passion of believers to be zealous, to be zealots for what is good. And doing good should be in our very nature as believers. We surely will avoid suffering, Peter says, caused by persecution if we are zealots for good deeds. And in fact, he already said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. You see the point there that good deeds softens the hearts of those who are antagonistic to, the, to, the, to Christians and to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when they see our good deeds, the result would be they would glorify God on the day of visitation. They will um, get be interested in the gospel that we believe, and they too will be saved. That is what we see here. And um, even the apostle of uh, CCM has a mission vision, sharing and showing Christ's love through helping others. So that is what we see, and that was that is what we should be passionate to be doing. And Paul says that doing good adorns the gospel. That is what we read in Titus and chapter 2. And then verse 7 and 10. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, not filtering, but showing all good faith in verse 10. So that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. So good deeds, my brethren, adorns the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just ask you, can you say that you are zealous for what is good or for good deeds? Are you really zealous? Or you, are you passive with this? Uh, 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 with, with, with this um, um, say uh, duty as well uh, are you passionate are you zealous for good deeds okay so who is there to harm you Peter says Peter asks remember you can avoid suffering caused by persecution by doing what is good or good deeds that is how we avoid suffering caused by persecution do good deeds you can be assured peter is saying that you will avoid suffering if you continue doing good but there we also find here the second point an exemption to the general rule in verse 14 we read but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake you will be blessed. Now, Peter, he, Peter here shows that in the process of being zealous for good deeds, a believer is met with persecution that leads to suffering. Have you experienced that? And you say, I've done nothing wrong. I'm just doing good, uh, um, just helping the person. And then what, uh, uh, what resulted is I'm now the one being persecuted and I'm suffering for doing that. Have you experienced that? You see, well, good often softens the hearts of some people. Yet the truth is others grow hardened by our good deeds. So Peter is simply saying, you know what? Not all are pleased with what we are doing, what good we are doing. Others are hardened by it. Now, this is true, especially in those situations where the goodness of a Christian life stands in stark contrast with, to, to evil in the life 
of an unbeliever because this exposes him to what he is, a wicked, sinful person. Then he may hate the light that exposes his sin and try to extinguish it. Do you know that? Um, they hate the good deeds of Christians because it exposes them. It exposes their stupidity in committing sins, and so they hate. They seek to distinguish um, believers and do everything to really uh, persecute, uh, to cause them to suffer. So it is in this case that Christians suffer because of righteousness, what we read here in verse, uh, in verse uh, 14, even if you should suffer for righteousness sake. In other words, for doing what is right, for doing what is good. And people, some people would not like that. We hear from the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ in John 3, 19 and 20. Um, uh, no, from, from John himself. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. That is precisely the reason why after all of the good deeds that Christians do, after all the righteousness that Christians show, they hate it, they don't like it, because their evil deeds will be exposed by them. I already shared to you a testimony of a person who sought my counsel when he was working in a city hall in the legal department where the common uh, uh, you know, activity there is corruption. The top one, the, the top one, the number one boss is getting all the bribery. And then at the end of the day, they divide the loot. And then, so of course, the uh, boss will get the highest uh, percentage of the bribes of the collection. And he could not stand it as a Christian. And so he asked my counsel and I told them, and I told him, you must, if you cannot expose that sin, you get out because you are not supposed to be there. They would not like you there. They will do everything to persecute you. They will do everything to make you suffer so that you will not go against them. But then, Peter here gives an encouragement. Now you will read, he says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, okay, you have done good, you're doing good, you're doing the right thing, and yet you suffer for doing that, Paul says, you will be blessed. You are blessed. If this is the case, Peter declares, you will you are blessed you will be blessed isn't this precisely what the lord jesus christ thought in the beatitudes and when we go back to chapter when we go to matthew 5 10 to 22 and there the lord said blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for there is in the kingdom is the kingdom of heaven blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. <coughs> you see what the, what the Lord is saying there? Blessed are you. Happy are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sake. Why? Because yours is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven. Yours, he says, uh, you have great rewards in heaven. You may suffer in this life, but your reward is in heaven with the Lord. And that is why Peter can say in here, in his letter, in chapter 1, verse 6, you can rejoice when you encounter various trials, that kind of joy that is not outward joy, but inner joy. Knowing Jesus as your Redeemer, 
and the promises of eternal inheritance in the Lord Jesus Christ, even if you are encountering various trials, you can rejoice. Remember here as well, Peter said in chapter 2, and then in verse 20, Peter said, J, uh, Pete, Peter, uh, chapter 2, and then verse 20, he says, For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your fault, you take faults, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Isn't that precisely what Peter is saying here? Look, even if you are persecuted, you suffer for righteousness' sake, you are commendable before God. In other words, look at the approval of God on you. You are not seeking the approval of men by uh, standing for what is right and by doing what is good. God is there approving you and commending you. So if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. So here, Paul is giving us God's approval and commendation. Look, your reward in heaven is great. The kingdom of heaven is yours. And so what Peter is doing here is he is making believers to veer away from focusing on our present pitiful situation of suffering to that glorious state in heaven. So that we can say with the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 35, 38, and 39, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is, which is in Christ Jesus. Because you are blessed if you suffer for doing what is good and for righteousness sake. And you know, Peter knows this blessing. He too had to suffer like the Lord. He was incarcerated or imprisoned for the gospel. He was beaten for the gospel. And history says that he was even crucified upside down. And he knows that it is, that it is a blessing to suffer for doing what is right and for doing what is good. So we have seen those two things, my brethren. To avoid suffering caused by persecution, be zealous for good works, right? That's the safest way to avoid a suffering caused by persecution. Be zealous for good deeds. But, Peter says, in case, and it is really very possible, that not all will be pleased for your good works, for doing what is right, so they will persecute you. You will still suffer out because of that. But Peter declares, you are blessed. God will bless you. You have the eternal blessing of heaven, the eternal blessing of eternal life in the presence of our dear God and Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, what Peter now does in this part, uh, I, when knowing that it is blessed to do good or for righteousness sake, even in the midst of suffering, there are several implications that Peter is saying here in this passage. The first thing is this. He says that, uh, uh, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. That is the, that is the principle. And so the first one, quoting from the passage we read in the Old Testament, Old Testament in, in, in Isaiah chapter 8, do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. 
there is no now no reason for you to fear even your persecutors who are seeking you harm have no fear of them why because god approves you god commends you and god blesses you even uh, as they persecute you and cause you suffering remember in hebrews 13:5 and 6 it tells us that let your conduct be without covetousness be content with such things as you have for he himself has said i will never leave you nor forsake you so we may boldly say the lord is my helper i will not fear what can man do to me if god's promise of abiding presence is with you there is no way to fear even those mighty men who would seek us harm because god is with us and god will never leave us nor forsake us on that times when we are uh, suffering because of persecution don't there is no reason to fear my brethren if that is now your situation there is no reason to fear god here peter declares you are blessed if you are doing that and then the second thing that we as an implication of that he says here and in uh nor be troubled don't be troubled there is no uh see what peter now is saying here there is no reason for you to fear and there is also no reason for you for you to be anxious or to be troubled remember in john 14 verse 1 our lord says in the upper room let not your heart be troubled you believe in god believe also in me if you believe in god and believe the lord jesus christ don't let your heart be troubled in the face of persecution and suffering because god here promises that he is going to be with us that he is going to bless us even in this kind of situation then the third implication is what we find in verse 15 but set apart or sanctify the lord god in your hearts or in your hearts honor christ the lord as holy or sanctify god the lord jesus christ in your heart so there is now this implication and now if this is the case that god blesses his children when they are as, when they are zealous for good works for good deeds and yet they are as suffering because of persecution what he is now saying then sanctify the lord in your heart set the lord jesus christ apart as as, as your sovereign lord there in your heart in other words peter is saying you are not alone christ is there and you must set him apart there in your heart you know that jesus christ cares for you as peter eventually says in chapter 5 verse 7 cast all your care upon him for he cares for you there you have to sanctify the lord in your heart you are to magnify the sovereignty of god in your own heart you're not alone he cares for you that is what the that is the third implication knowing that we are blessed in doing in pursuing good or for righteousness sake even in the face of suffering and then fourthly what we find in verse 15 as well is this so uh thirdly sanctify the lord in your hearts and then and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who ask you a reason for the hope that is in you and so you see here the words used here or paul is saying now your situation is an opportunity to defend the christian hope that is what 
Peter is saying here. So when we are in this kind of situation, suffering for righteousness sake, it is an opportunity to defend the Christian hope. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. The word used here, defense, is apologia. It is used to defend oneself in court. This is the key passage in apologetics, which is called in defense of the faith. So we have apologetics here. But Peter here is not referring to complicated doctrines that only the learned can speak, can understand. But he is simply speaking about that hope, that simple hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. What is that kind of hope? You don't have to be educated in a, in a well-known prominent uh, academy to understand your hope. You don't have to understand uh, Greek and Hebrew language to, to, to understand your hope. That is good to know. That is good to learn. You don't have to graduate from an, an institution where there is this training in theology to know your hope. But Peter is simply saying here, be ready, be prepared about your hope. Depend it, speak it to others, all Christians, not only those educated Christians, all Christians going through this kind of situation, they are to be ready to give a defense of their faith, of their hope in, a, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps this is what is happening here. People may be wondering why believers remain peaceful and loving in spite of, in spite of what they go through. In spite of their sufferings, why are they still peaceful and loving and concerned for doing good and what is right? Even in the face of suffering, perhaps they will be. Uh, they are asking, "What do they seem hopeful in the face of suffering?" So they may ask about the reason of hope. Why are you like that? Christian, dear Christian, brethren, brothers and sisters, people will ask you, why in the face of suffering you still very hopeful? You are still very hopeful. Why? Why are you hopeful? That is the question here. And if I ask you now, there, in your own, uh, where at whatever you're doing, listen to me, just asking, can you articulate that simple hope or that hope in simple terms? Answer me. Give your answer. Can you articulate, articulate your hope in simple terms? Can you articulate your hope in one sentence or two? Can you? So that when they ask you what is your hope in the face of suffering, you can simply tell them in simple terms, why you, uh, why you continue to have this hope. Can you say, my hope is in Jesus Christ who died for me. My hope is in Jesus Christ who took away my sins. My hope is in Christ who rose from the dead and he is going to come back and take me with him in glory forevermore. My hope is that um, uh, he's going to raise me up when he comes again on the last day. My hope is to be with him in glory forevermore. Can you articulate that in your own hope, in your in defense of your hope in the Lord Jesus Christ and before these people? So they will be asking, why do you continue uh, to appear like peaceful? and still loving and um, 
joyful in the face of suffering. Now you know, because your hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they may, they may, might also ask you, how can I get that hope? Do you know that? They are interested of the hope of believers, why in the midst of suffering, they remain hopeful. And then they will ask, how can I have that hope? How can I have that hope? And I ask you, how can you have that hope? Can you answer me, dear brother and sister? I have that. I, I, I got that hope because he showed me my sin and gave me repentance and faith in Christ. So I came to him for salvation and there he saved me. That's how I got this hope. I was lost, but now am found. I am uh, the wretched sinner, the chief of all sinners, yet he forgave me by his own precious blood. That is how I got this hope. So friends, if you are listening to me now, how would you be able to get this hope? By believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, by repenting of your sins, and then you will have this hope. I hope you do that. And of course, uh, another implication is uh, fifthly, you can, you can be gentle and respectful because you know that you are blessed. Even though you're suffering, you can be gentle and respectful. You can defend the faith, your hope, with gentleness and respect. That's how you give the defense of your hope. That's how unbelievers get attracted to our hope because we are still loving and patient even though they are persecuting us. You can have a good conscience. Having a good conscience, it is the conviction that you are doing what is right. And perturbed and swayed by the evil arguments of people, uh, the pragmatic arguments, they saying, everybody is doing it. Why not join us? Why not do it? No. A believer stands for what is right. And so having a good conscience, indeed, he will continue doing what is right because he knows that his conscience will be violated if we will do what is in violation of God's law. Now look at the end goal here. So that when you are slandered, those who revile you, your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Right? Have that kind of goal. Be zealous for good works. That even if they persecute you and cause suffering to you, your end goal is that those who slander, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. They will uh, be rebuked and perhaps at the end they will get interested of what we believe what our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me just ask you, because this is the time when everybody, almost, even many Christians are suffering because of COVID-19. So even if you suffer not because of persecution, you're saying, but I'm suffering not because of, you know, I'm being persecuted. Now, probably you are facing severe illness, or now you are infected with COVID. Or even now you are isolated in a, in a place far from your loved ones. Now as believers, when you suffer, remember this. You are blessed. You are always blessed, my brothers and sisters. How am I blessed in the face of suffering? Because in suffering, we are made aware that God is closer to us and that God assures us that we have the hope of glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. That nothing is hidden from our God whom we set apart in our hearts and we know and we believe that all things work together for good to them that love God. Brethren, 
Brothers and sisters, whatever you are going through, Peter says, you are blessed because you have the hope of eternal glory. You have God with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So just challenge you, my friends. If you are suffering and you are an unbeliever, Christ is not your Lord and your Savior. And then what is your hope in that kind of situation? You are worse. You are already suffering and yet you don't have this hope. It's a double, tawagin natin, job, double job or D. Eh, naghihirap ka na nga, wala ka pang pag -asa. But here, Peter is telling us there is that hope in the face of suffering. You will suffer, you may suffer, but with this hope you are blessed. That is what Paul is saying, uh, Peter is saying. So I'm just closing with the story again of Elizabeth Elliot. You know that Jim Elliot, a missionary to Ecuador, was killed with uh, the five other, with uh, the four other missionaries uh, by the native Auca tribe in Ecuador. Elizabeth, there when his husband was killed by these people, Elizabeth refused to give up on these people. She continued to live there and ministered and do good deeds to these people. Together with her is her daughter, Rachel, her daughter and Rachel Saint, husband of uh, uh, one of the missionaries who were killed by the Oak. Oka tribe. And because of that, zealous for good works, some of them, those who killed Jim Elliot, became a believer. They were converted through the ministry of Elizabeth Elliot and others who were with her. That's how we persevere. We are zealous even in the face of uh, our enemies that cause us suffering in order that we may win them for the Lord Jesus Christ. May we not give up doing good deeds, even in the face of suffering for Christ and his gospel. Let us be zealous for every good work. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you once again for this passage which speaks to us. That even though Christians suffer, suffer, we know that uh, you are blessing us. You know that your approval and com com commendation is with us. We know that we, are, we have a better uh, promise of eternal glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that the kingdom is ours. We know that we have rewards. In the heaven, in, he in the heavens, in your presence, O oh Lord. We know that one day we shall be with you forever. So make our minds, O oh Lord, be veered away from what well, of our sad circumstances in this, in this line, but so that we can look at our glorious uh, destiny in the presence of. You, of you and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you back all the praises and the glory and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.